Oh, Michael, it's so good to be in front of you again, my friend, having a conversation that needs to be told. Uh, you know, people are talking about the money system. People are talking about banking system, all the crazy stuff that's going on with world governments. But you and I have a story to tell. Uh, and we've actually been there. We've done that. We've we've been into the court system. We've worked with those banks. We've seen firsthand, you know, how devastating this financial system is and what it can do. Um, watching men in black robes bowing and praying for judgment to this person they call the Lord. You know, what's actually going on? And I'm so privileged to be here with you today, having a discussion about the banking system, about our story, and telling this that needs to be told. Michael, what a pleasure, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Scotty. And it's really high time that we have this conversation, because as you say, uh, you and I went through it uh, from 2009 through to 2013, uh, we stood up, we took on the banks here in South Africa. We faced the, 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 the highest level of justice and high courts and Supreme Court and, and the Constitutional Court. And we failed at all levels with strong arguments that were admitted by the banks, admitted by the legal representatives, and we still couldn't win. So we have a, a story to tell, as you say, that we walk the talk. We, we're not just hearing it or reading about it. It's a very important story to share with people. It's about promissory notes. It's about money. It's about banking, the origins of money, central banks, uh, Bank of International Settlement. And then the, the what I call, you know, money as a tool of mass destruction. Because people talk about yeah. tools as destruction. And, and it's been sold to us as like, you know, um, most of the time it's sold to us as atomic weapons or some dangerous bombs that can explode and stuff like that. But what people that simply don't know because they don't know is that those are not the, the, the weapons of mass destruction we should be worried about. The weapons of mass destruction is like harp and uh, directed energy weapons or DEW as they're often called. Uh, D-E-W, that can blow up a building and make it fall down uh, and turn into powder or create earthquakes or create hurricanes or tornadoes and create huge disasters, create tidal waves and floods and create nonstop rain and hail and snow and drought. This is all technology that exists. But let me tell you, none of that technology is as invasive and pervasive and effective as the number one tool of mass destruction, and that is the global financial and monetary system. Yeah. Because that yeah. affects every single living, breathing human being every day of our lives. It destroys our lives, destroys families, takes away our homes, our farms, our food, and makes people commit suicide. It rips families apart. It rips communities apart. It destroys inventions and technology. It is unquestionably, in my mind, the number one tool of mass destruction. And we're going to discuss that in full detail. And agenda. It's, it serves other people's agendas because they have so much money that they can effectively implement whatever they like uh, in, in, in affecting our lives. So I want to go right into the detail now. And remember, you and I had a conversation. Well, how long was it? Maybe 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. It was a long time ago. Um, and we started getting into uh, the bills of exchange. Now, one of, for people listening to this now, it's really important to understand something. Money does not exist. There is no such thing as money. Now, you're thinking, oh, how can that be possible? I have a, my wallet and my purse and I have this, the stuff I walk around with a card. It's not money. It is the promise to pay money. And that promise is evidenced on a piece of paper or evidenced in your bank account. It is merely a promise to pay money. There's no actual money. Since we left gold and all that um little sticks with grooves in it in ancient Babylon. There is no money. There are only two kinds of money as per the Bills of Exchange Act. And this is what I want to chat with you, Michael. I remember you were texting me like every few minutes going, I'm reading the Bills of Exchange Act. Did you know this, this uh, promissory note was this and this definition of this? This one statute of law, which is exactly the same with maybe a few little word changes all around the world from the USA to India, to the UK, to Europe, to Australia, to Africa, it's the same way that money is defined. You have bills of exchange and promissory notes. Do you remember that, Michael, reading that bills of exchange act and going, holy moly? Yeah. Yeah, no, the, I remember it very well. Uh, and and that's really what, what gave us the knowledge and the confidence to go up against the banks because suddenly we felt empowered because we, we actually read the bills of exchange. We read the court rules. We understood what money thing is and how bills of exchange and promissory notes work and how they clustered together into what they call uh, negotiable instruments and 
And so these very high level words and terminology that most people don't even know exist. And, and I, I remember uh, uh, Black's, you know, Black's Dictionary and, and these other... Black's um, Law Dictionary. Yeah, you know, Black's Law Dictionary and so forth. I mean, when we were immersed in that from 2009 to 2013, nearly almost 2014... Uh, it, it is a debilitating, life-changing, consuming, energy-sapping situation to be in because the when you take on the banks, as you know, they have infinite amounts of money. And we'll talk about where they get that so-called money from, but they can put their lawyers into court forever. They can, they can drag this out for the rest of your life. And that's how they normally debilitate and destroy anyone that tries to take them on. Mm -hmm. Well, because we defended ourselves and we didn't use lawyers, we didn't have any expenses. But what we did is we had lawyers advising us and working with us, and we made notes on a piece of paper, then go into court and stand there in our shorts and T-shirts and argue these <laughs> against the highest paid lawyers in the world. Uh, and just, uh, just for the record, just so you guys know, and listen, to, just for the for the record, they did have the highest paid lawyers because we got sent obviously bills and they showed us this whole process afterwards. They were the most ex the, the lawyers on the other side of the banks when we took our our case to court. And when I say our, uh, it was Michael and I. Uh, had two separate cases, but we went into court together. And then Michael actually took it further himself, uh, going to the constitutional court. And there's a great story and photographs of us delivering these documents to the constitutional court. I mean, it was it was absolutely incredible. Um, but we had law. And not only that, Scotty, do you, do you remember we delivered those documents to the South African Reserve Bank as well? And the, yes. the hundred questions and the confusion when we delivered yeah. these yeah. documents. We summoned we the, the central bank of the country with these documents. And <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was, when it was, we arrived there in the basement, you have to park in the basement. Then yeah. you have to go to the security and they ask you, well, what are you doing here? Who are you here to see? And you say, we, we're here to serve papers on the governor of the, the uh, Reserve Bank. The I know. What? Central what? Bank. And remember, Michael, private security. For those of you who don't know, central banks have their own private security. They do not use the police system like in, in the country. They have a private security. It's really important to understand how central banks are not part of the country itself. They have their own, yeah. effectively their own jurisdiction. And this is where it all, we saw this firsthand. This wasn't something we we heard some guy talk about on YouTube. This is stuff we actually went through. And we had law books. I mean, I would be sitting there through law books, reading the stuff up and, and really getting to grips with understanding. As you said, Michael, what is a negotiable instrument? What is a bill of exchange? What is a promissory note? And how all these things come together. And yes, we served those documents. It was It was hilarious. In a terrifying it was way. hilarious. Um, I think before we uh, jump to that part of our conversation, shall we start by just talking about money, this thing called money, what it is, and where does it come from, and why do we use it? Because you know, to, to the average common person on the street, it's like, well, money is part of life. If we didn't have money, we couldn't exist. Money makes the world go around. All these statements that we hear all our lives since we are born, we are born into a world where without money, you can't do anything. It's that simple. So virtually 100% of us cannot imagine a world without money. And that personally, that's the journey that I started in 2004 and five when I started to imagine a world without money. And that eventually led to the Ubuntu movement and the One Small Town Initiative that is now exploding around the world. And maybe we'll end on that note to say that the One Small Town Initiative is the antidote for all this greed, corruption, and the weapon of mass destruction that's destroying all our lives. And it does it gently, easily, Without any violence, opposition, or conflict, it doesn't challenge the money system, doesn't challenge the governments, doesn't challenge the banks. It creates, it presents a new alternative that uses these tools of enslavement as tools of liberation so that it works for the people. And when it eventually works for the people at the highest possible level, people will realize that we don't actually need money. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, let's <laughs> so, let's let's begin with that. Let's talk, let's talk about that. Because uh, going back to the days of the gold, the goldsmiths. Um, there you, you would have, uh, and that's where the word bench comes from, by the way, the, the bank, uh, um, the word uh, bench is bunker, which is actually the origin of the word bank. So it comes from the bench because it's a work, a worksmith's bench, which is where the goldsmith used to keep the money and the silver and the gold. And then along came these individual people and said, listen, will you keep my gold for me? Cause you're fashioning in it. You're working with it. And slowly the goldsmiths became, I think many people still have a surname of goldsmiths. I mean, there's got the word gold is, is common in, 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 in surnames, even, even to this day. So what would then happen is you would have this bench, right? They would work from the, from the bench. They would take all these gold, the gold and silver coins, they would keep it. And then one day they'd realize, well, hang on a second. Um, nobody wants to walk around with gold and silver and bags of it. So we'll just give them a, piece of paper 
that serves in effect as money. And if you read the law books, that's actually what it is. There's no such thing as money. There's only pieces of paper or evidence on a computer screen that serves in effect as money. And that's how the scam began. So it's important also, I remember when we were in court against the banks and I was researching all of this stuff as we all were working together, coming up with arguments and so forth. And the whole securitization issue as well, which is a whole nother scam that we need to touch upon. Um, <clears throat> so what um, what I realized is when I, when I researched the word money, do you remember it keeps putting you money and it refers you to another section of Black's Law Dictionary. And then when you get to that section, it refers vaguely to another section. And then eventually it says, well, it's it's legal tender or something like that. And But yeah. it's literally the word money yeah, remains very vague. Very, yeah. very vague. Yeah, that's because it, do it doesn't exist. And the same with the word credit. Um, you need to be very careful. There's no such thing as a loan. You will never actually see the word loan unless it's been predefined very cleverly within any loan contracts because the concept of a loan does not exist. There's no such thing. Nobody, yeah. The bank does not take money out of its account and give it to you and put it in your account. In fact, it's not really your account either. We can go into some, some detail on that. <clears throat> but this whole notion of what actually is money is so important to, to define, Michael. And we learned this. We saw them. The banks admitted it. They said in the... For those of you listening to this, in the High Court rules of South Africa, it says you can pay off a debt using a bill of exchange or a promissory note. It says that in the High Court rules. When you read and the definition, then it gets very interesting because you can just create it, Michael. Yeah, and I remember the very first day in court against Shem Simon. And for those people in South Africa that know South African lawyers and advocates, you will know Shem Simon. I'm not sure if he's still practicing. At the time, he was up against us as the advocate, was the highest paid advocate in South Africa. He was the guy that represented the banks. The and, and this guy apparently never lost a case. He was Mr. Cool Hand Luke. He destroyed, silently destroyed all his opposition. That was his reputation. But we made this guy squeal and squirm and spit and shout and, and his veins on his neck were standing out. We thought he was going to have a heart attack in that last day in court, but I'm jumping now. But what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to come to, the very first day in court when you and I were sitting together, they lumped our two cases together. Mm -hmm. uh, they were trying to, they were trying to sort of uh, judge us as some sort of a cult. Do you remember that? They said, oh, these guys represent a cult. And, and then we said, okay, what does a cult mean? You know, a cult is any religious organization or movement. I said, great, yes, we are a cult. And therefore we have rights. And, and cults have very strong rights. And then suddenly they realized, oh boy, they can't call us a cult because then suddenly we have all kinds of other rights. And then they just uh, divided us. And, and, and then uh, Scotty did his own, <laughs> own case on his own. And I did my own case on my own. But when we approached this and we, we dug our heels in and said, well, we're not going to pay you uh, until you provide us with a bill. Yes. And, uh, and maybe uh, we need to start at that point, like why yes. and how get into the into the case into the court case but yeah. again before we get there uh what we must mention and what i must mention is that the goldsmith case and the the case of of goldsmiths taking in the money that is a more recent uh, event the and how money then became promissory notes became used in the last several hundred years and and maybe 500 years or so forth or a thousand years then there's the knights templar that used to uh issue promissory notes to pilgrims to, to the promised land and so forth. So uh, th that's that's what I call the modern day money system, which is then perfected by the Rothschild. It's, it's the, when it's the, the scam. It's when the scam yeah. uh, became real. You're right. The history goes uh, goes back in. That's in where the scam. Time. Take us. Yeah, take the us to the real origins. Yeah. Yeah, the Rothschilds took this idea and took the scam, and they took, they really made it theirs, and they and they they took control of the world with that scam. They they were master mind manipulators. But the origins of money is absolutely spectacular. And it's really when I discovered the origins of money is when I writing when I was writing my first book, Slave Species of God, and um, and uh, and draw the distinction between God with a big G and God's with a small G. It's very important for people to understand why I say slave species of God, not because God is a megalomaniac psychopath. Uh, that's that those are the gods with a small G, the 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 crazy beings that we don't you know, we don't know who they were and where they came from and, and why they were here. We speculate why we think that we know, but the gods with the small g are not the same as the creator of the universe or the god with a big g. So that's why it's called slave species of god with a small g. And that I know that in the beginning that confused a lot of people. 
So while I was writing that book, I discovered to my horror what these gods with the small g, uh, which is very clearly spelled out in the Sumerian clay tablets, when money comes from and when money first appears on earth. And that is clearly written in the, um, spelled out in the king's lists. And it talks about when the first kings appeared on earth. And therefore, we now know what the origins of the royal bloodline is and where they suddenly appear from. Suddenly, we have these kings on earth, these high priest kings that appear on earth who ruled the world. And, and suddenly, they owned all the land. And they were appointed by the gods, these priest kings. And these priest kings lived for thousands of years, according to the Sumerian text. And they ruled over many lands. And they had mass or weapons of mass destruction or powerful weapons with which they could smite the people. Now, you've got to pay attention to this. This is not something to take lightly. People wouldn't listen to somebody unless they, had, unless they were fearful of somebody. They were not going to obey you unless you have something that threatens them with which, and you know that they can harm you. And that's what these priest kings had. They had these powerful weapons with which they could smite an entire village or an entire city. And therefore, people obeyed them and did what the hell they were told, right? And these first kings then took control of the world. They owned all the land. People had to work for them and bring them all the stuff that they were building and growing. And, in, and um, one of the key things they did is they built these big temples from which they ruled. They were impenetrable temples that nobody could get into. They had security of their own, just like you mentioned. Even the banks today have security of their own. Uh, with you know serious weapons, but the f the other thing that blew my mind what they did is they started to issue promissory notes or created the first form of money on clay tablets. They told the people to bring in their gold and bring in their silver, and they would keep it in the temple, or well, like the banks, like the goldsmiths used to do, and then in return they would give the people a piece of clay, and written on the clay is that John Smith brought in five pieces of silver or three pieces of gold. And that now was the person's promissory note that their silver or gold is in the temple with a priest king. So that is the true origins of money and the so-called promissory note. It goes back 6,000 years. That's how far back the scam goes, people. Yes. I give you gold and you give me a piece of clay. Uh, sorry, I don't see how that. They is want the real. They want. They want what's real and tangible. They want the gold and the silver and the precious metal. But they also want our work and what we build and the land and what gets built on the land and the resources on the land and what's grown on the land. So this whole money system is really a black hole that is just sucking human energy into it and getting very little in return. And we haven't even started on interest yet. So that's interesting, Michael. It goes all the way back to um, to, to the ancient times, uh, very, you know, long, long time ago with these clay tablets. And even today, when you read the Bills of Exchange Act, and you've, you've just it's probably the most important document to understand about banking, you will see that there's only two kinds of money. A promissory note which has got two people involved. I promise Michael Tellinger on a piece of paper and a bill of exchange, which is three people. And it's one person pay, orders another person to pay a third person, which is where the, the checks, the old fashioned checks come from. Now, what's really important, if you read the, 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 the actual high court rules in South Africa, it, it says you can pay a debt with a promissory note or a bill of exchange. The definition of promissory note is just a piece of paper written, I promise to pay whatever this amount of money, signed, dated, complies with the Bills of Exchange Act. Because why should, right, and this is super, super important, why should a piece of paper from a bank be any different from a piece of paper from a human being? Just hear us out here, because it's going to be quite difficult to kind of get your head around a little bit. But we, the people, are supposed to be at the top of the pyramid, so to speak, and all the institutions underneath that are supposed to serve us. So a piece of paper signed by a person still complies to the Bills of Exchange Act to this day because there's no gold and silver backing up. So based on the law, because money does not exist, it's all a scam, in theory, we should be able to go to a bank and pay a debt using the same little kind of clay tablet concept they did back in back in ancient times, but it still fits the definition of a promissory note. How do you feel about that, Michael? I mean, you got really involved in this with, with your case. Yeah. You know, the, the, the famous part of our case is that um, 
I eventually ended up paying the banks with my own promissory note, a million rand, uh, out, which they accepted. So I created history. I created a precedent. And I wish that our lawyers would use this legal precedent in their cases against the banks. But the lawyers don't use it because they know if they use that, they're going to they're gonna lose their job. The bank, because most of the lawyers in South Africa and most countries have a bank somewhere as a client. And so if they start to go up against the banks, they will lose a portion of their income. And often it's a substantial portion of the income. So this is, it's just terrible. It's, it's just, unfortunately, our, we are so tied up in this and they've got us so caught up in this, the banks and the legal system. There are very few lawyers that are prepared to take on the banks. I want to come back briefly to, um, uh, to the, the gold and the original priest kings. So that 6,000 years ago or further back in time, quite possibly, um, we, you already have an indication that these guys were obsessed with gold. And that's the other big question is, what is this thing about gold? Why were they obsessed with gold? And that's when we, when they started to hold all the gold in their temples. And, and, um, and we keep asking, well, why were they obsessed with gold at that time? And, uh, and that's when it gets really interesting when you start getting into the other different forms of state of gold, the monoatomic form of gold and the healing properties of monoatomic forms of gold and the fact that it might give you um, longevity and, and perpetual life and so forth. And uh, that's a whole nother discussion, but it's really important to pay attention to that. Who were these original priest kings? Were they human or were they not really human? And why did they need so much gold? And they were using the people to bring the gold to them and in exchange, give them a piece of clay. Yes. <laughs> it's just to serve, in, to serve in effect of money. Money does not exist. It's really important. Yeah. The evidence that you see of money in your bank account or on, in your hand is a promise to pay money. And that promise can never be honored. And then there's interest on top of that, which um, is just a whole another uh, scam on its own. So let's just really, uh, just really understand that. A promissory note. I take a piece of paper and you can read this up in the law books yourself. It's promissory note is me promising to pay somebody, sign it, date it, put the amount in it. And that's a promissory note. That's literally the legal yes. definition of money. It doesn't say who has to write that promissory note. It doesn't, it doesn't have to say it comes from a bank or a corporation. It just says that is a promissory note. In fact, the original promissory notes were all created by people anyway. And that legally yes. is a promissory note. And they've actually changed uh, many of the contracts. The same with the word credit. The, the word credit comes from Latin, credere, creda, which means to believe. It is a belief. It's literally a belief. It doesn't exist. So now when you start to understand how promissory notes and bills of exchange work, we won't go into too much detail on bills of exchange, which is an, an order. We start to really see how the enslavement process begins. Because if you're a goldsmith and you've got this money and you're giving away pieces of paper, you can suddenly do something interesting. You can create loans but you're not loaning a bag of gold. You're loaning a piece of paper which represents the bag of gold. All the bags of gold are sitting in behind you in your in your in your locked up shelf or the temple or wherever it, wherever it happens to be. So you've got all this this gold and silver, but nobody's asking for the gold and silver. They're walking around with your 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 notes, your promissory notes, and your bills of exchange. So they're walking around. There's suddenly a bank can go. Hmm, I've got a really good idea. Why don't I just start giving out loans, which is just more and more pieces of paper. And the pieces of paper, when you add them all up, are far more than the actual gold I've got. In other words, I'm creating a scam. I'm creating money out of nothing. I'm just making pieces of paper and loaning this. And they have to bring back gold or the equivalent in piece of paper with interest. So suddenly you've got this concept where I might have one kilogram of gold, but I've got 10 kilograms of loans out there and everybody has these pieces of paper. And this is where it all went to hell. So in, in essence, what happens then, you are insolvent, right? <laughs> because you, you're lending something that you don't have. Uh, with the other, uh, I want to come back to why we ended up in court and why we took on the banks. But just before I go there, the next, my next statement, <laughs> I want to talk about the, the, the word negative growth. I love that, negative growth. You, know, you have a negative balance on your account. It's like, wow, you, know, you can have $10 in your wallet or you can have nothing in your wallet. You can never have minus $10 in your wallet. So the entire concept of negative growth is an inhumane idea. The fact that you can have negative balance on your bank account is a nonsensical theoretical concept that all of us have bought because of the fictitious 
and the, the farce of the, the, the money system. You can't have your, your $10 bill doesn't suddenly turn to a negative $10 bill. You have zero or you have money. You can never have minus money. And that's really important. And, uh, that, negative growth. It's just... <laughs> That, that's a the big tree one, went right? inwards. <laughs> yeah. So the word negative growth, it is so in, unscientific, yeah. insane, and and it just it just indicative of how we've been lied to. Look at that and negatively growing orchard. It's 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 yeah. you know it's no it is you're right it's 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 completely counterintuitive to everyone. So so uh, no it's it's it is ridiculous. So we so we in court and we're sitting there and the banks are basically admitting. Now, hold on, study. Oh no, we need to. I, I want to just start by saying why did we end up in court? And the reason I ended up in court, uh, you can you can explain why you ended up in court. The reason I ended up in court is that uh, sometime in 2008 and 2009, you and I started talking about this whole bills of exchange and and um, and 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 return for value, and that you can use a bill that was sent to you as a promissory note to say thank you very much. I accept this bill, and I herefore turn this bill into a, a legal bill of exchange and I'm settling this bill uh, with my signature, accept it for value and pay you with this bill. So you've concluded the circular uh, loop of transaction and then we discovered that the banks actually don't even have your contract. They shouldn't be charging you because if you sign your, your bond, uh, your mortgage bond, mortgage which means death. So yeah. again, and bond, bondage. Bondage. Yeah. So pay attention to the words. In my book, uh, Ubuntu contributionism. There's a whole chapter on the on the, the 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 meaning of words in English and where they come from, Latin and and Greek sometimes, uh, and how they those words are, are were created to enslave us and and literally enslave us by we using them and we creating magic as we speak them into reality and we we use these words not even realizing what they mean. That's mm. so very important. So I I had a property that I bought on spec as an investment. And I was about a month behind or two months behind in my mortgage because I was traveling. I forgot to pay it. And then the bank starts to get heavy with me. Instead of saying me, please catch up, they start sending me you know, all these legal letters. And I said, oh, wow, okay. And at that stage, I realized that the banks don't even own the contract. When you sign the agreement, your mortgage agreement with the banks, they sell it on to a third party called the Securitization Agency. Now, in South Africa, in those days, we had about... Four, I think four securitization agency, Blue Granite, oh, no. I think. No, there were actually more. We actually discovered over 30 of them in the end. Yeah, we listed them okay. all in that case. Yeah, we thought there were only four, and then we opened up this unbelievable can of worms. Yeah. So, and, so what the banks do is they basically take our contracts that we, we promise to pay for the house or the car or whatever it is that you get a loan on from a bank. And they take that as a promissory note and they secure it with a, with a company called Secur a Securitization Agency or company. Every country have, has one. And these are, the, these are the guys that sit between the central banks and, and the banks. And I mean, these guys, they, they pretty much run the world. And securitization agencies are evil, evil places. God, uh, I almost want to jump track and talk about my experience in Switzerland. And, and Austria with a, a guy that was starting a securitization agency. And literally, you start a securitization agency. If you're one of the elite that is invited to start one, and, uh, and you basically get a blank check to take money from banks, spend it, use it, and then after make billions of pounds, dollars, or euros in 24 months, and then shut it down. And it is a scam of the highest order. I've never seen anything like this in my life. In any case, so the banks take your mortgage bond and they sell it to the securitization agency. And the securitization agency then takes all these bonds, they bundle them together, and they and they float them on the stock markets and they trade them. And this is one of the things that they do. So in essence, what the bank has done, they're no longer the holder of the note. They're not no longer the owner of the agreement that you signed with them. They've sold it. So they have no right to send you monthly bills and extort money from you. because So if they're no longer the owner or the holder of the note, they can't ask you for money. The new owner or holder of the note must ask you for money. And if they continue asking for money, it's a crime. It's extortion. It's fraud. The least thing they should do is tell you, we're no longer the holder of the note. 
or the bond. We have sold it to X, Y, and Z, but we have been appointed as a third-party agent to collect money on behalf of Blue Granite Securitization Agency. If they did that, then it would disclose what they're doing, but they don't do that. And they keep asking you for money. They were paid in full. They get Remember, when they sell your, your contract or your mortgage bond to the securitization agency, they get paid out in full and several times the amount of your property that you are paying off over 15 or 20 or 30 years. It is a scam of the highest proportion that people just cannot begin to fathom. So I discovered I'm, I'm that. Don't have my money. You owe me. We made you a loan. You, 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 it's, you, it's your duty as a citizen to pay back your debts. If someone lends you money, yeah. you should always pay it back. That's what you should do. And they have this. And there, yeah. there's certain, there's certain, um, uh, you know, if somebody does loan, if I, if, if, if I loan you, Michael, some money, or you loan me, it's a good idea to pay that person back because they're using it for food or whatever. There's, there's, a, there's an honesty in there. But this yeah. scam that's yeah. running. I mean, if you take an overdraft, you mentioned negative, for example. If your overdraft, if you go into overdraft, that money didn't exist. It's completely fictitious. A loan yeah. is a complete fiction. It comes out of thin air. They don't loan money from one to the other. That's why they call it credit, because it's a belief. It's yes. not a loan. I want you to please understand that you do not have a loan. You have a belief that you were lent something, and you then have a duty-bound contract, right? a contract to then constantly keep paying and paying and paying and paying that mortgage preferably until you die with interest on something that is doesn't exist yeah and and the whole world the whole word repay repay yes yes so you just you never actually get off that you know in theory that, but these enough these are now uh, real semantics let's not go into that, that kind of finer detail a lot of this stuff is in my book, the Ubuntu book, uh, in, in more detail. But I want to come back why we ended up in court. So so I then, Scotty and I, you and I were talking about this whole thing about securitization. Yeah, you know, we're all new to this and and we we're reading other people and guys that were that knew about it for years already and, and really getting uh, clued up on this. And and I said, hold on. So if the bank doesn't own my my bond anymore, they sold it to a securitization agency, they shouldn't be able to to ask money for from me. And and then if I can use their bill, if they send me a bill, I can accept it for value and pay them with that same negotiable instrument and settle the amount. Um, and uh, so I asked the bank to send me a bill. I wanted to pay the outstanding mortgage with one lump sum payment and I wanted to settle it. And I asked them to send me a bill mm -hmm. and they refused. I still till today cannot understand why they refuse to send me a bill? And we're talking about standard no, bank. Well, we know why, though, because they, 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 they can't send you a bill because, once again, the definition of a bill is a bill of exchange, which is an order yes. for you to pay. So, okay, so this is really important for those listening. What, a, what should ha really happen, right, is when the bank wants its money back or when somebody wants its money back, their money back that they've loaned you, they're supposed to put in a piece of paper and they're supposed to create a bill of exchange, which is an order. In other words, I... Standard Bank or your, the, the bank order you, Scott Kundal, to pay Standard Bank. You can have two parties in a three-party system. It can get a bit weird, but you can still have that. So what they should be doing, what we're effectively saying is send me a bill, right? If there's been an authentic exchange of value, right? If you've really given me something, like at a dinner, I go to dinner at a restaurant and they get food and then they give me a bill, there's been an exchange. What they're supposed to do is they should give you a bill and say, listen, we lent you the money. Here's a bill to get it back that conforms to the Bills of Exchange Act that specifically uh, follows that ancient uh, uh, pieces of paper that were sent around. Now, this little piece of paper is what Michael and I did as well. As I said to them, send me a bill. If there's been a fair transfer, if there's been a, a fair exchange, you should be able to send me a bill. And what happened when you asked for it? Yeah, so they simply refused. They refused to send me a bill. As Scotty now explained, why they refused to send me a bill. They send you an account, a statement of, of accounts and your and your negative balance. credit, that negative balance of credit that you that you have to pay in in money, in fiat currency. So ne they never send you a bill. One piece of paper saying you owe us X amount of money. And this is a bill. And I wanted that bill because I wanted to use that as a, a negotiable instrument and a bill of exchange and a promissory note. And they didn't. So I said, well, if you don't send me a bill so I can settle this amount, I'm not paying you any more money. And, uh, and that's when they took me to court. So that's how we ended up in court, right? So it wasn't uh, that I, was, uh, I, did, I couldn't pay or anything like that. 
which doesn't matter if I couldn't pay. Millions of people can't pay, and then they end up losing their properties. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, while we're on this subject, think about this. You buy a car, you buy a house, you buy a boat, you buy a farm, you buy sheep or cows, or, or you buy anything. If you can't, and you buy it on credit, if you can't pay it back, who takes it back? Does the government take it back? Does, the, does your neighbor take it back? Does the, no, the bank takes it back. If you can't pay for that thing that you bought, uh, the bank takes it back. The bank takes your house, your car, your possesses, repossesses. So the bank ultimately ends up owning everything. So just this is a horrific thought that the banks. So when we say that the banks own the world, I literally actually figuratively mean that they own everything because whatever you whatever we buy and pay for with their fictitious fiat currencies, they then lay ownership too because they can take it back because they gave you this fictitious means to acquire that and then if no that's it's it's just ridiculous so back in court so now we're in court and for some reason scott and i did this at the same time so now we get our court dates on exactly the same time so we end up in court in the same courtroom Jeez. facing this side by side they thought that we are part of some sort of a cult that were trying to undermine the banks and and attack the banks, right? Nah. We were just asking questions. Just before you carry on, what happened with me is I sent uh, a document uh, to the bank and I said, if you could answer these 10 questions, then I will happily pay it. I just need an answer. Just, and they were very, very simple uh, questions. I, I wish I could remember each one of them. But the gist of it is, if you could just show me that there was an actual transaction, that you actually did pay me, the, if you loaned me the money, then I'll happily pay it. It was so, it, it's so simple. People can't get their head around. So yeah. I did that and I asked them simple questions to show me, show me that there was a loan. Where was it? And they yeah. freaked out. So that's what I did. I asked them questions. They couldn't answer it. And that's why I wanted to take it further. But carry on, carry on, Michael. Yeah, you, you just reminded me, I copied you and I did the same thing. And I remember I was still, I was still somewhere down there in, in Belito Bay on, on, the, on, on, the, on, the, on the KwaZulu Natal coast. And I had to go to a, find a, a lawyer who was a, uh, and what do you call them? The guys that stamp it, the, the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, yeah, the justice of the peace who do the, um, the, yeah, the authentication. Uh, yeah. When you yeah, got I forget what they call now. David, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The stamp affidavits. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so I had to notary. find one of, uh, a notary, a public notary. That's right. And I had to go and uh, get them to stamp the documents. It was like a 15 page document that I sent as well, asking certain questions and making certain statements. And uh, and boy, they just deny. I got that email back. Uh, you remember they we're getting the email Who from do you the think legal you are? These questions are non-relevant to you, to the man. It's literally like that. But remember, we had the whole new era base, so we were sending out to a hundred thousand people. So I think yes. roughly somewhere between five, maybe around five thousand letters were sent by people all around South Africa to their bank with ten questions answering. Yes, <laughs> they. <laughs> so so uh, that's right. I forgot about that, Scotty. That's really important because uh, so what people don't know is that you then started New Economics Rights Alliance, New Era, and you had like quarter of a million members on that database. Yeah. Uh, of just yeah. signing up left, right and center. They wanted to be part of this exposing the banking scam. And, um, and so many of those members were sending these letters of demand asking questions of their banks and asking proof of, you know, showing them documents of this and, and proof that their, their bond was not, not securitized to a securitization agency. There was, I think, one of the questions, I need proof that you are still the holder of my, of my bond, of my note, that you didn't sell it. I know that it was definitely one of the questions. And boy, I think that's why they thought we were part of some sort of a cult. And they must have gotten a fright because... If, if 10,000 people suddenly send notes like this to the bank or emails demanding stuff like this from a bank, <coughs> it will definitely look, look, look like it's an orchestrated attack on the banks. And that's probably, yeah. and they, I realize it now, oh, I just remembered, right. that's why they lumped us together as one case because they thought the we were doing leaders. this. <laughs> cult leaders, yeah. And then I said, yes. Attack. Yeah, I remember saying, attack, yes, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> and remember that, it's that when you go into court they wear black robes in australia and some countries they still wear wigs i mean it's ridiculous they wear black robes and you bow and you pray for judgment to my lord 
Remember, you've got to understand the ritualisticness of this. And in your book, we write, Michael, we don't have to go into detail because we talk a lot about the where the words come from in the legal system and its <clears> connection <throat> with maritime law and the law of the sea. That's why you're insolvent. That's why your business can go under. Um, that's why you have all these, you know, negotiable instruments where you have an island, you ship products, you still ship your Amazon products, even if there's no water inside, why you have an airport, where all this comes from, and how that then connects to citizenship. And what is a citizenship? Like, why is it a ship? And how does that work? And why do you have yeah. to have a passport in order to be able to travel? And are you a and traveler? Or are you a designated driver? And why do you have passages? And are you above board? Or are you below board? Don't sink, you know, you might sink and you go under uh, all these words and how this connects to the legal system, which then connects to us as people. Mm -hmm. Because remember, it's not just the land and the gold. Ultimately, it's the people and our energy, which is being sucked into the system that's being controlled by a very, very few number of people. Yeah, yeah I, I, I remember somewhere on my YouTube channel, there's that statement that I read in bank, that, uh, in, in, in the court that first day that I read the whole thing about the banks and the, why we are there. We're here to expose the whole corrupt nature of the bank system. And I, I remember that judge, a judge stood there, sat there, and it was like, what the hell? Who are these people reading this weird statement? They've probably never heard anything like this. But I, I tell you, on YouTube, is it still there? It is on YouTube. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not very good quality sound, but I think you recorded it. You had that little flash drive that could record, and you. <laughs> we were sitting there. I was speech. there turning the pages, and you're reading that you know, corrupt and corruption. Yeah, it was just like, oh my. Um, yeah, it was. So, so, so it was that first day they accused us of being a cult, and now now remember why? Because they got suddenly they got inundated with. Thousands of uh, letters and emails from thousands of New Era's members, which is ten the questions, just questions, yeah. not I'm going to burn your plate. No, it wasn't. It was completely peaceful. It just said, please answer these questions. That's all we want. If you answer these questions, yeah. no problem. We'll pay it back. That's all it was, Michael. It was so yeah. ridiculously gentle. Yeah. And then we went, um, then then that that advocate that handled our case that first day completely screwed it up. He he really got the banks into a pickle there because he wasn't ready for our arguments. And we're a bunch of bunch of lay people who are really well prepared. And we had we had arguments and questions that they, they couldn't deal with. So they replaced that that young uh, sort of inexperienced advocate with uh, with Shem Simon. Yes, the oh, next and the top the course. top guys, yeah. Yeah. Top guy in the country, the number yeah. one guy in the country. They suddenly realized, oh, shit, we better get our top guy onto this. And that's when they separated us because I said, yes, yes, we are a, yes, judge, not my lord. We are a cult and cults have rights. And uh, and that's when I go, went, okay, we better don't bring up the word cult again because then it's like, you know, a, a church is a cult. <laughs> so <laughs> church is defined as a cult. So it's actually very interesting. So so let's carry on. So it was in that second uh, second hearing that we went to. And I remember the first day in court, we presented our case and you you had some arguments and I had some arguments. And there was a there was a substitute judge that was really, really interested. This yeah. guy was he He's was a substitute up Iceland judge. and uh, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. Yeah, the crisis. Yeah. And, and he crisis. was in, he was actually interested in what we were saying. <laughs> so he said, well, listen. Uh, since the bank couldn't effectively answer some of the questions that we posed, he wanted to go away and do some research and have a look at this and set another date for us to come back to court to hear uh, follow-up arguments while he was more informed about the things that we said. Well, they got rid of that guy very quickly <laughs> and they replaced him with another judge that was obviously very well uh, trained on how to handle the situation and they put Shem Simon in, in there, the number one top area uh, advocate, um, just for people outside of South Africa. An advocate is a high level barrister. lawyer. It's a barrister. Yeah, it's like a barrister in the UK. They wear black robes. They are the only guys who can go into the Supreme Court. The lawyers aren't allowed in the Supreme Court. And they argue in their black robes in front of my lord or my lordship, or if my lordship pleases, if it pleases my lordship, that's the judge, right? That's the it's my Lord. And um, they bow down when they go in, in their black robes. And it's when Lord they go with a small L, Michael, not, it's like yes, God with a small with G, it's small Lord L. with a small L. <laughs> yes. And when they leave the high court, they go out backwards in their black robes, bowing yeah. to 
on the on uh, on where the judge sits. So Scotty and I irritated everybody by not calling him the Lord. We called him Judge. So we keep calling him Judge and not my Lord because he's not my Lord. He's a judge. Okay. Now <clears throat> this thing about the judge. If you ask somebody, the person who's sitting on in front of you, right, or who's supposed to be the judge, if you have the guts to do it, which very few people have, but some have done this, and my goodness, full respect. They stand up and they say to the judge, before we do this, can you please confirm your oath of office? Now, this is incredibly important, your oath of office, because the oath of office is a judge. It's a bit like when you go to a doctor or somebody say, can you please confirm your hypocritic, your Hippocratic oath to me, right? They won't do it because the judge is not acting as a true ju judge dissemin disseminating common law, what we would be referred to as justice. They are acting on behalf of the bank, which is why they sit on a bench. Remember I told you before, bench comes from, uh, the word bank comes from the word bench, and a judge sits on the bench because that's where the worksmith, the goldsmith, it's a bench. The word yeah. bankrupt in German literally translates as broken bench because when the bankers, the goldsmiths, <laughs> were caught cheating, I don't know how, obviously not caught often enough because that's all they did, but when they were caught, they would break their bench in public, and that was known as bankrupt. Which is which is broken bench. So the judge does not have an oath of office. They will not say that oath because they're acting effectively as a banker. That's why in every courtroom there's a cashier. Why on earth would there be a cashier in a courtroom? It doesn't make any sense. That disseminates justice where you've got to go and you've got to pay these bills. So you've got to be really cognizant of who the Lord is that they're bowing to versus who the law the Lord is purporting to be. Yeah. All right. So back to the court. So the second day or the third, this was like the third time we appeared in court. This is probably sometime late 2010, maybe early 2011. Who knows? I can't remember clearly. And um, and um, we at that stage, Shem Simon was there. And at some stage during his little speech, he said, everybody knows that the that the banks accept payments in with bills of exchange and promissory notes. Yes. And I was looking at you. <laughs> just I looked at Scotty and I said, he just admitted that banks accept payment with promissory notes and bills of exchange. Yeah. Jump up. Jump up and say, okay, great. Thank you. I'll write you a promissory note right now and, and let's call this quits. I was going to do that, but I thank God I didn't because that I would have been thrown out. Or I would have been just told to shut up and sit down. <laughs> Because the judge would not have allowed that. And and that if the judge didn't allow it then, then I would have been in trouble three years later when I did eventually pay the banks with my own promissory notes, which they accepted. And um, <clears throat> so Scotty and I just looked at each other and I said to him, uh, we'll use this later. Or you said that to me, don't worry, yeah. we'll use this later. Well, this is going to come in very handy later on. <laughs> and it did. It came in extremely handy because if I – did not create the promissory notes uh, at middle of 2013, but did not pay the bank with the promissory notes that I created on a normal piece of paper like this, a blank piece of paper. I paid them a million rand. That would have bankrupted me. It would have it would have destroyed me. I would have lost everything I had at, at that stage. And that was uh, quite a traumatic time for me. So, so we so, must be careful here, though, Michael. My, and I want you to just clarify something for me because um, – my understanding is that the banks don't accept it in the long term. They're still going to come back because I don't want people sitting here listening to this, writing our promissory notes, unless you like really prepared for all hell to break loose because they yes. they, they just ignore it and they come after you in different ways. And yeah. it's important that this yeah. is not a get out of debt free scam that we're running. It's so important no. that you're not, we're not advocating that at all. And I think I just yes. think you need to make that clear. Yeah, I, so I, I'm going to say this categorically now. I'm not saying that you should now start going writing your promissory notes and paying everybody with promissory notes and thinking you can go out there and do this. Please do not do this. It is a nightmare. It is an absolute last gasp um, effort to save yourself. If there's no way out and you're going to lose everything, that's what then try and do that. Write your own promissory note. Use it. Look at my promissory note the way it was created. Get a, 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 a graphic designer to recreate it for you and write in your own country's specific uh, laws that we refer to in South African law, like they refer to the Bill, Bills of Exchange Act, so and so, and uh, and 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 the, court rules, and the court rules X, Y, and Z that that says very clearly. Um, I forget the. It. 
Yes. But but a debt uh, a debt is uh, is what's the word Re yeah, released? Honored. Was it honored? A, de a debt is complete or co uh, something like that. I see. I've already forgotten the bloody yeah, words. I know, but but it's important because those legal words are saying what it, it says. A, the debt would be honored or whatever it word, um, or deemed paid, whatever it is, when you present a bill of exchange or a promissory note. So on you, delivery. Upon delivery, delivery on, on demand. demand. Yes. Yes. So delivery, upon the, yes. the 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 debt is uh, is is uh, complete. Jeez, now I'm terrible. I should have looked at this. It's on the promissory note and it's in my book and all that. But so upon delivering of the promissory note and the person accepts a promissory note, the debt is resolved or or it's done. It's finished. You've paid it. And that's the court rules. Yeah. Right. So it's pretty simple. So we use that. Bank. I delivered my promissory notes to the bank through their lawyers. It was accepted and stamped as delivered. It means I have paid that debt mm. to the bank. And the reason they accept it, I'm be very, very clear about this. That's why I do not recommend anybody goes down this road because it's going to open a can of worms that you do not want to get involved in. The bank will, first of all, the bank is going to just ignore your emails. It's going to ignore your, your payments and it's going to get you into deeper trouble in court. They're going to claim that they never received it and all that and whatever. And, it's just, and you don't have the time and money to fight them. That's the big problem. Um, so... Uh, <clears throat> Now I lost my train of thought completely. Well, we're talking about the, the, the definition of the um of of that you can, but the, the important thing is you can pay it with a promissory note. It's in their own law, it's in their own words. They just won't yes. accept it for obvious reasons. But it's important to understand yes. the real world as we see the real world, which is obviously an illusion itself, versus the real illusion, which is the debt that you've got. And that's the it's just it's important to understand that because it'll just open your eyes to so many new things. I just realized where I was going with this. Um, the reason the bank accepted my promissory notes, because we'd been in court for nearly four years yeah. and, uh, and they just didn't want any more bad media exposure because of that very last day in court. You remember when they handed that f that fraudulent pre judgment, which we'll talk about briefly, um, it, the whole court gasped, like, <gasps> where did that judgment come from? So yeah. this was why. As well, explain it while we're here. So um, after four years of in court, where the bank just could not pull the one over us, I, I kept getting out of it, and they kept having to call me in. They just couldn't beat me at this game for four years. And eventually, after four years, we were in court for about three hours. Shem Simon was there. He was screaming and shouting, and that's when he admitted. Everybody knows the bank has got no money. Every the banks don't have vaults of money. His exact yes, words: vaults of money. Everybody, yes. Yeah, banks don't. Everybody have knows the banks don't have vaults of money and cash lying around. Everybody knows that the bank securitizes and they use securitization uh, as part of their daily banking activity. And he had, he admitted everything that we were arguing for the last nearly four years, and nearly had a heart attack doing it. While we kept interrupting him, say, "Sorry, he's lying, Judge. It's not true." And the judge would freak out, say, "Sit down. You're not allowed to talk." You're will come and every I kept it I think I interrupted him like four or five times during his his monologue and that he you know remember these guys are not used to that if I was a lawyer or another advocate interrupting him I'd be disbarred I'd be chased out of the court but as a layperson you can do that and boy did I use that to my advantage and my benefit I completely rattled his cage and I think that's why he he was so unsettled and rattled that I mean, I remember that he was red in the face. I thought he was going to have a bloody heart attack. The veins were standing on his neck. He was spitting as he was talking, shouting. And I still kept interrupting him. And he admitted all that stuff. And then the judge looks at me and he says, so do you have anything to say? Anything to add? I said, yes, uh, please. You need to cross-examine him. He's just admitted everything we've been arguing since 2009 or 2010. Yeah, and, and then... The and then the, the judge says, no, this is my court, my case. I'll handle it the way I want. If you have nothing to add, I'll hand down my judgment. Yes. And that's, that's where it got interesting because he just basically read out what she He looked it up. Then he turns. Thing. That's what he says to me. Then he turns to his side. He had his bag and, and some other clothes to the side of him. He looked up his bag and pulled out a piece of paper and read the judgment from a piece of paper. That's literally what happened. Exactly as I've described it. The no whole way court for the Lord to act. Uh, the whole court of about 100 people went, where did he 
get that paper from? When judgment and read back Shem Simon's words that he had written in his uh, in his uh, his original heads of argument. No, it was it was a yeah. complete scam. When we did the new era version of this, where we actually took the banks to court for securitization on behalf of a large number of people. Um, uh, which is a, a separate court case. Um, it was a bit like a kind of class action, but we wanted to really just make, you know, rattle rattle some cages and hopefully get, I mean, it, it would have been a dream. It, it didn't work out, unfortunately. It would have been a dream to have uh, helped a, a good thousand odd South Africans who couldn't physically couldn't pay their their loans and their homes and were getting kicked out of their houses. We wanted to give them some relief. That was the plan. But courts were definitely having, having absolutely, absolutely none of that. They had four, right? They had because we took the four banks to court and the Reserve Bank. There were five of them. They were all in court and they had four lawyers. One of them represented, I think, the Reserve Bank and one of the major banks. They had four of the top lawyers in the country all representing those banks. They got paid one morning for 15 minutes work. Um, it was hundreds of thousands of, of South African rands. It was it was just unbelievable because they sent us the bill. This is how seriously they took it. The director of litigation for South Africa's largest corporation, uh, lawyer, corporate lawyer uh, company. In fact, in, if you go into downtown Santon in Johannesburg, the actual law firms, you can look at the buildings. Their buildings are bigger than the banks. They look down on the banks. That's literally what the buildings do of those, those law firms. So the director of litigation personally handled Michael and my case. Do you remember that? Yeah, Aslam Musaji. You talk about Aslam. Yeah, Aslam Musaji was the top bull terrier uh, uh, fighter pit bull um, lawyer that was put onto this case. You know, like the top litigation lawyer in the country at the time that was put on onto our two cases. Yeah, I remember it very well. I remember standing in the in the Supreme Court in Joburg. Uh, while we were waiting to go and see the judge, like before the court case, there were a few of those instances. I'm not sure you were even there in some of those. I was there on my own. And I was there with Aslam Musaji and Shem Simon waiting in the in the judge's chambers, waiting to go in to talk to the judge before we go into the court. You know, this these are these are moments that that I just I suddenly remember this. And then Shem Simon would ask me, why are you doing this? You know, why are you why are you so angry about the banks? And I say, and I and I said to him, look. The fact that you're asking me that question clearly shows me you've got no idea what you're doing, that you're working for the devil. I remember telling, telling Shem Simon this. So he said, you must realize that you're working for the devil and just look into your heart. How will your children feel about what it is that you're doing for a living when your children realize that you're defending the banks and you're destroying millions of ordinary South Africans' lives by defending the banks, making people lose their homes, making them commit suicide, Literally, you have blood on your hands because of the job that you do. For a credit, a belief. It doesn't exist. It's a scam. It's a fraud. Now, I know we're all yeah. in the scam and we need the scam to survive. We need it for bus fare and we need it to food and we need to grow these, these things. And, you know, for positive growth, actual real growth instead of negative, negative growth. So we need, we're in the scam. We get it. We have to play by these rules, at least to some yeah. level. We, we know. And, and, you know, Michael, your whole one small town uh, is, 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 is the alternative to this, to getting us out of the slavery, because the fact of the matter is, when you see it and when you get it and when you start to look at that the concept of the how how the the merit what's called maritime law why doesn't the judge do an oath of office because they're effectively bankers it all comes from shipping merchants they they they, they took the law of the sea and they encroached on the law of the land and that's why you'll still stand in a dock i mean all these shipping terms within the legal system just repeated over and over again and why they still everything is shipped if, if you think about we are if you think about uh, all the ship, you know, French ship, uh, you got transport, uh, you've got internship, uh, just uh, receivership, you know, ship. ownership, receivership. Uh, membership, all that's just like everything is a blood ship. It's all based on maritime registration, law. registration, registration, regis, which is the crown. Who, who created these what are called letters of mark that it was created through legal effectively legal piracy so if you yeah. if you flew the queen's flag or the king's flag on your ship you were a pirate but you were a legal pirate so if you saw somebody who was in inverted commas breaking the law and the pirates were more kind of the the ones that are you know li living off kind of natural law I'm not saying they were good people but they, when you understand both sides of the story it makes a little bit more sense so you would have these letters of mark, which is basically saying you, your, your majesty's ship has the right to take down that ship. You can keep all of it, just give 20% or 50% to the crown. And this became legal piracy. 
the same legal piracy system is how the courts and the banking system works today. It's the same concept. Yeah. So just to finish that thought for people that want to thinking about using promissory notes, please don't do it. The only reason that the banks accepted my promissory notes is because they didn't want any more heat. They just wanted this to go away. Because by the time we were in court four years later, suddenly the media was really paying attention. Yeah, suddenly the scam going on. In 2010, I was this conspiracy theorist. They were interviewing me on radio stations, like laughing at me, belittling me, you know, like in my face. That because they were defending the banks. They think there's some crazy guy trying to take down the reputable, wonderful banks that are making our lives possible and making it possible for us to do business. Little did they know. And these are, again, these are in, uh, you know, ignorant journalists and, and radio DJs and TV hosts that just have simply no idea what's going on. Um, there's that video clip on uh, that I was on C CNBC, uh, MSNBC yes. or whatever in, in Johannesburg, uh, where I uh, when we had the constitutional court case against the banks. Um, and that's still, you know, that's had, I don't know, huge amounts of view where I talk about the banks and, and the constitutional court case. So after we lost this case in the Supreme Court, we took it to the constitutional court case. We'll talk about that briefly, but then we need to come back to the other things, central banks, uh, BIS, the Rothschilds. Uh, and what is a people's bank? What's the difference between let's, people's Let's talk about that structure now, Michael. Let's go through that. Let's talk yeah. about how the pyramid structure of the bank works from the Bank of Inter International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, which most people don't even know exists. So you've got the, the, yeah. the, the Bank of International Settlements, and then you have the central banks. It's like the central bank of all central banks. People think your central bank in your country is like, that's where the buck stops, the Federal Reserve and if in America or whatever it happens to be, the Bank of England. No, there's a higher bank even above that. And you have something called special drawing rights on, on the Bank of International Settlement, which is effectively a license to print money forever. So what happens is it filters down through billions and trillions of euros or whatever you want to call it. It's all one banking system, by the way. Whoever says, oh, we're going towards one world banking system and that's like the Illuminati. It's been done. That was, was done. We've been on one <laughs> banking system for ages. So it's already it's already yeah. kind of happened um, in that particular way. But yeah, talk about that. You've got the bank of international yeah. you've got the central banks that make money out of thin air and loan it to the other banks, which go to the commercial banks, and then eventually comes yeah. down to us and we get screwed. So so look, it's it's ultimately what we call it, uh, what we call it, what we refer to it as the as the global banking Rothschild Empire or the Rothschild Banking Empire, all started by the Rothschild family. Um, in the 16, uh, 1760 something, uh, and and they literally just took this ancient scam of creating promissory notes and taking people's gold, and they perfected it. And they just went into Europe and they set up their banks, and and they started to fund the wars and and fund wars and 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 the different side sides against each other. The entire bank of uh, the war of independence in the United States was all about retaining the rights for the Rothschilds. To have their their central bank, their their federal bank, the Rothschilds' yeah. own bank, and that was what the American wars are all about, in essence, so mm -hmm. that the people can run their bank. So let's quickly dis distinguish yeah. between central between bank, they, central banks, yes, and just just and before you get banks. on there, um, if you if for those listening to this, there's a brilliant essay from a couple of decades ago. Just Google it; it's online. It's called "All Wars Are Banker Wars." It's been you can read it and you can hear the, the guy who wrote the essay actually transcribe it and read it out to, to you. All wars are banker wars. So what Michael talking about is not conspiracy. You have to understand that in placing a banking system into a country will result in war if the people in that country reject it. So carry on, Michael. Yeah. So so it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to determine where exactly is the ultimate office or ultimate building or bank yeah. building that controls all of this. But at this stage, it looks like it's in the city of London, in that square mile in the city of London from where the Rothschild banking empire controls the entire global banking system. That's what it seems like. They may have moved it somewhere else, but that's what we, it seems like. Under that one head office that controls all central banks and all banking and all money in the world, it's, I will say that with exception, obviously, of countries like North Korea and, and, uh, and who knows what other countries at this stage, there are very few countries that no longer fall under their control. China is an interesting one. I'm not sure how China operates. 
and since Russia is not really very friendly, but they, they, their banking still seems to somehow be controlled by this Rothschild banking empire. I don't understand how and why, why any country would want to have their, their financial system controlled by this, but that's a that we can discuss that later. So the city of London, and for people that don't know, the city of London is not London, the, the town of London. City of London is a square mile in the center of, of London where the, the temple is on the River Thames, uh, where the temple was built in, in, in 1078 or whatever it is. And that was really where the, the seed of, of power was established in London and where the banking empire was established for, uh, for the world uh, from there already. And um, the temple, Templars, you know, it all comes together, right? Um, and, uh, and from there, where all the banking head offices are, they seem to rule the global banking empire from there. Then in Basel, Switzerland, you have the BIS or the Bank for International Settlements. That's like the, the 2IC to the, the Rothschild banking control. And from the BIS, they control every single central bank. Now, as Scotty said earlier, our central banks in our countries do not belong to the government. They do not belong to the people. They do not belong to the government. They are a law unto themselves. Please pay attention to this. Central banks do not fall under the jurisdiction or the constitution even of our countries. They literally are a law unto themselves. They can do what they want. You cannot, you cannot charge them with anything. You cannot charge them with fraud. You cannot audit them. They are untouchable. So that is a huge thing to realize. These are privately owned institutions, all our central banks, from the Federal Reserve Bank to the South African Reserve Bank, every central bank in every country, and they're controlled from BIS, the Bank for International Settlements. The BIS barks the instructions and commands to all the central banks. So when our ministers of finance do their annual speech and their annual budget, that is written and prepared for them by the central bank. It's always done in, in cahoots with the central bank. So they literally control everything that happens. The central bank's role is issuing money to our countries. They generate the money that they then lend to our governments, and our governments then put that, that money goes through our governments into our banks. Well, it's something like that. It's 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 very fuzzy and fudgy, but in essence, it's, it's important the that other way around. It's often the banks to the government, or or, or potentially because there's there's banks that lend money to the government. The basic structure is the same. It filters down, and then each exactly. time it does that, it gets fractionalized so that yes. it's multiplied that can be loaned out. Because a lot of people say, well, yeah. banks can't make money out of thin air forever. Well, technically they can, yes. but the way they look like it can't is to create this fractional system where they can only yes. have to keep ten percent in reserve. But ten percent of what? It's all fake anyway. It's all it's all a scam yeah. anyway. So it's just an accounting entry to make it look like they've got it under control. Meanwhile, they're still securitizing it in the back, like you mentioned. So, they, and can I mention this? Sorry, Michael. I want to for you listening to this. I want you to understand something. There is unlimited money. Yes. Money is not a finite resource. There's enough money to grow the plants, to feed the people, to grow, to, to have the houses, to have everybody. There's enough money for everybody. I want you all to understand yeah. that. The fact that it doesn't get to those people, that's the, in brackets, conspiracy. That's that, and that is, that why it's so important to learn this stuff. Yeah, and that and that, the fact that it doesn't get to the people, doesn't serve the people, doesn't help the people, is because it's a control mechanism. It is that that weapon of mass destruction that destroys the people. It's the scarcity of money, how they channel it, how they how they how they um, shrink it, and and how they strangle it you know, from getting to the people. Yes. And this is the difference between a central bank that's privately owned, that there is a law unto itself, the Rothschild banking empire, or a people's bank, a people's bank that belongs to the people, not the government, the people's bank, where the people are in control of issuing their own currency and their own legal tender. That's a completely different thing. If we, as the people, owned and controlled our bank. We will issue as much money as we need to do everything because we want to improve our towns, improve our cities, improve our agriculture, our healthcare, our education, everything. So we will issue as much money as we need into each industry so that it becomes, it has the best possible opportunity to deliver the best results for us, the people, because it's our bank. We issue the money to ourselves, which means if we owned the People's Bank, we would have 
not a five-star, a seven-star country. Everything would be bloody on steroids. We'd have the best healthcare. We'd be curing all disease. We'll have free energy and free electricity everywhere. We'll have food coming out of our ears. Nobody would be homeless. Everybody would live in absolute luxury. The only problem is that there'll be some people exploiting the financial and the money system to benefit themselves and not the entire community. So while a people's bank may be, if it's run honorably, may be a solution to uplift the country, it is also open for exploitation by uh, unscrupulous or, or greedy uh, individuals. So this is the very important thing. A central bank lends money to our government and our country and the banks. Our government borrows money from the central bank. This is why we're always in debt, right? And this is why when the, when the central bank sets the interest rate, that's the money that the Rothschilds make. We all work for the Rothschilds. Every living, breathing human being, when you pay interest to a bank, is interest that ultimately goes to the Rothschild banking empire. And like Scotty said, there's enough money in the world. They keep making it out of thin air because they can. They enforce that rule that gives them the exclusive right to be the creators of money around the world. This is the, the, the incredible criminal activity that's going on. Anybody else tries to create money, you get locked up for life, but they can create money and they control all our central banks. And this is why our countries are always in debt. This is why we are always in debt because we owe money to our banks, who in essence owe interest, interest to our banks and, and interest that will eventually kill you uh, if you can't pay it back, that keeps growing and accumulating and it all goes back up to the Rothschilds. And just to make it very, very clear, it's not about the money, okay? It's never about the money. The money is just a tool of control. It's very important. People think, oh, these guys have so much money. That guy's got a, a you know, $200 billion. This is the richest person in the world. It means nothing. The central banks can cripple Elon Musk in 24 hours if they want to. They can cripple Bill Gates in 24 hours if they want to. They have that kind of power. And if you don't know that, then you have no idea the power the banks have. Please pay attention to this. Okay. They, yeah. Yeah. No, no, they, you've, you've, you've said that very eloquently and, and passionately, 100%, Michael. And for those listening to this, I want you to really understand something. I don't want you to see it as an honor, but that's the word I'm going to use. Why are they, whoever these they are, so hell bent on controlling people it's because we are special we have within us a a structure a, a beautiful eternal understanding of cosmological beauty a, a 15 dimensional uh, crystalline structure that works on an eternal base principles that are just so beautiful and so incredible we as human beings are just amazing we are angelic in our own ways and we have this and we have the structure and it goes against the way that they see their finite black hole based uh, energy sucking vortexes of of constantly it's this is what we're doing we're, we're taking a stand and we're holding our ground in a beautiful incredible peaceful way by simply just exposing step by step and creating alternative structures like michael's doing with one small town but you've got to understand something you are special the system is trying to do everything in its power to make you believe you are yes. weak and useless and you are nothing yes. nothing could be further from the truth very very well said scotty and i will echo that you as a human being every single living be breathing human being is born special we are divine creations we are we have magic in our bodies we are we are examples of magic being created from nothing comes this this conscious being that has free will and the capacity to think and, 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 and love and embrace and create. The fact that we can create music, we can conceptualize, imagine, conceptualize music, hear it, then we can score it on a piece of paper, then we can hand it out to a bunch of musicians who play their parts and together comes mm -hmm. this incredible piece that came out of nowhere, a piece of music that moves air, that moves our emotions, that make us cry or makes us scared. That, if that is not an example that we are divine creatures uh, and that we are absolutely special of creating magic and manifesting our thoughts, manifesting anything that we're capable of thinking, that is your example. Our capacity to create 
and record and perform music. And this is why I believe that many of the people in the in the healing, in the consciousness movement, in the 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 high consciousness movement, so many of them are musicians, musicians or sound engineers or or someone that is involved in music that work with sound, with harmonics, with with uh, with vibration and frequency. I find it fascinating. Um, it's, you, you are here. Uh, it's beautiful. And just keep in mind, what are we talking about? The banking system and the structures. Why are the arts always struggling financially? Why are the arts always the first to go? Why are the arts always, always in dire straits where people do it because of passion? And the ones who make money, the real money out there on the on the on the Super Bowl at halftime with this grotesque nonsense that they do is 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 as dumbed down music. And it's it's low, it's such low frequency music and this horrible kind of horrible lyrics and stuff that, that gets played over and over in the air. So so you have the other version of it, but yet you have these people struggling and fighting, some dude with a guitar or or some girl singing in the in the in the in a square and just coming alive. It's just magic, like you said. Scotty, I I'll tell you what it, it reduces me to tears is watching like America's Got Talent or all the Got Talent shows. That shows you the desperate need for people around the world to express their abilities, to express their talents, their natural gifts that they were born with, not what they, the job they do or what they studied or graduated or having some degree. What People just want to be recognized for their talents and their abilities, their God-given talents and abilities. And, and they might have a, a job in a bank or, or a checkout teller at a at a grocery store and they come there and they've got the most incredible voice or they can play the most incredible instrument or do something remarkable. That to me, I tell you, it reduces me to tears every time I watch it because it mm. reminds me of the, 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 the indestructible nature of the human spirit that we just want to create. We want to constantly create. And that's what I always say when I, when I, for many years while I was doing my, Ubuntu lectures and the once more time lectures and, and workshops around the world when people say, yeah, but human nature is to be evil and nasty and, dis and destructive, and violent. And no, that's what you are led to believe. That's what we've been groomed into believing. Human nature is only one thing, and that's to create. That's to create, be creative, to love and to share. That has been beaten out of us by the system, whether it's the capitalist system or the 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 the, the, the religion or the pharmaceutical systems, or the governments of our countries, they beat it out of us, and they make us believe that we are evil, that we just want to destroy everything. It is horrible. We, must mar uh, we have to walk around with masks. We've got to mask our children. We've got to cover our faces. We've got to. We've got to not even breathe on each other. We've got to. We've got to. We've got to tell on each other. Uh, uh, and 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 as you were saying, Australia, dob someone in if they if they're breaking the law. You see your neighbor doing something. This is this is exactly. It's you. But when you see it, it's so clear. This the suppression, the contraction, the contract is also a verb. This whole contraction that's going on. Yeah. They're trying to compress, com contract, suppress. Um, bring down it because we have this incredible um, beauty inside us. I know that the interview and the conversation has taken on a slightly different turn, but I think this is where we need to go. It's all connected. To, yeah, absolutely. When all, we talk about you, I'll tell you. All of this is yeah. All of we, this is connected. Everything is connected. It's constant suppression. It's constant yeah. su suppression over and over again, and it's all done for our security, which is also <laughs> a double-edged sword because the word security doesn't mean safety. It means a financial security is what they're saying, because we have been turned into financial securities that can be used as collateral to pay back loans, which don't exist through the central bank system that Michael's explained to you. We are the chattel, as it was known to the cattle, the chattel property. We are those. And we need to understand that we can't get fully out of it yet. Although we're going to, Michael, with one small town and these steps and these alternatives that amazing people are doing around the world, that is a first step. We still have to play in it right now. We're still in it. We can't get out of it directly, but we sure as hell can minimize it and the pain and suffering that we're imposing on our families and our children of this, this, this suppressive structure. Um, we could, but we can, and we are making these changes, Michael. And what you're doing is, is obviously a huge step towards that. Well, so I want to go through just some of the, the bullet points we discussed here. And because I think we're sort of getting towards the end of this discussion, but it's important to understand that uh, money is a tool of enslavement. It's not about the money. Money is a tool of enslavement and a tool of control that keeps the money 
the money, the bankers and the, the Rothschild banking empire in control of humanity. That's how they control us and enslave us. So one of the steps, and I've been writing quite, being quite vocal about it, the one way that you can literally show middle finger to the Rothschilds is if you had uh, an honorable president or a prime minister or a leader of your country, and they say, well, you know, we're not going to play ball with you anymore. We say, uh, as of tomorrow, we are, we are turning the, our central bank into a people's bank. Literally, you, you know, the, the president can say that and, uh, and then stop playing with the Rothschilds, stop working with the Rothschilds and take over the, your central bank. Mm. And nothing changes except now the central bank belongs to the people, not to the government, belongs to the people. And you start issuing money for all the sectors of society in your country, however money you need for agriculture, for healthcare, for education, and start issuing money. Free money because it's our money. We now own the bank. So you don't have to change anything. You just say to the Rothschilds, thanks very much. We know how a printing press works. You press, you press print here and it prints out the money. You know, we're not stupid. We understand the scam now. So we're no longer pl going to play your game. We're going to issue our own money for our own needs so our people can prosper. And that can happen, literally. Any conscious president or prime minister can do that overnight. And well, boy, in theory, in practice, in theory, he'll, in get, theory. He'll, get... <laughs> he'll get assassinated. He'll get wiped out. He'll, he'll get put into a loony bin or asylum. So they will take somebody or he'll like suddenly that. Become a, um, there'll be charges laid against him for, you know, some kind of... For pedophilia or anything. Yeah, they, they, they use the, the full force of the... Of, of, of their henchmen around the world, which is the media and so forth. So, But in theory, that's possible. Mm -hmm. But th even if we could do that, that is still not a solution to the problem because ultimately that money is not necessary. That money is just something that we've been programmed to use. So what the One Small Town Initiative does, it's it very cleverly creates a foundation for a community to come together and use these tools of enslavement as tools of liberation. So we're using money. We get the community together, we're using money, we're using the legal system, we're using the corporate structures, we're using everything that's been given to us and tools that actually enslave us. We get together as a community, we work together in cooperation and collaboration so it benefits all of us. We stop competing against each other because that is one of the biggest evils that's ever happened, competition instead of collaboration. And remember, they keep telling us competition is good. Competition is a mother of invention. Without competition, there'd be no invention. And without money, there'd be nothing. You know, So competition and money and capitalism is what brings us all the great technology and inventions. No, nothing can be no. further from the The music that you were describing earlier doesn't come out of competition. Many of those examples that you gave of people that come up inspired to make music, those musics were that music wasn't inspired out of comp competition. So no. there's a perfect example of where you don't need competition to, to be a creator or co-creator. No. So remember, co capitalist competition actually does des destroys everything. Because in capitalism, if you invent something and you can outcompete your, your competitor, whether it's a, you know, a, a lawnmower or a bicycle if, or anything, if your, your creation or what you manufacture – is better or can be better or make more money for you, you'll do everything in your power to destroy your opposition. You'll go out there and you'll buy up all your competition, you'll buy up all your opposition. So you have complete monopoly and monopoly to make money and extort the people. And this is how the, the all the inventions of uh, the cures for cancer and cures for all disease, which we know there have been dozens and dozens and hundreds of uh, of beautiful inventors that have come up with incredible solutions and cures for all disease. You know, that is, we can say that categorically, all disease can be cured. And if you don't know that yet, then you're not well informed. Please pay attention to this. All disease can be cured, including quadriplegia, things like that. Yes, pay attention to what I'm saying here. Quadriplegics can be helped to walk with a very simple procedure. I've seen it and I know how to do it. And we have been in touch with inventors and healers around the world that most people don't even know about. So we can have all the free energy in the world and, and all the healing in the world. We can have all the food in the world, but all of this technology that affects all these industries and sectors are constantly suppressed and shut down. Inventors are bribed, threatened, killed, or simply paid off. So the inventions do not reach the people if it's going to benefit the people and neutralize the monopolies of the world. 
So capitalism is the worst possible toxic system we can find ourselves in. Cooperation and collaboration and what I call contributionism, where we all contribute towards the well-being of, of our society and our community. If we all contribute uh, our own specific skills, we are all going to benefit and contribute and help improve our society. And that's what contributionism and the One Small Town model is all about. So slowly but surely, we're moving there. And the One Small Town system uh, is this foundation where we use the tools of enslavement as tools of liberation, and we start to cooperate and collaborate on every level and slowly but surely bring in technologies and things that serve the people and help the people and create a lot of money, make a lot of money through our agriculture, our technology, and our, our, um, our stores that sell the retail, the stuff that we build and manufacture and grow at a cheaper price than the big Walmarts and the big exploitative capitalist stores. And slowly but surely, our town will not only be self-sufficient, but we'll be exporting everything we do and build and grow to other towns and other countries and make more money. So by cooperating and collaborating and stop competing against each other, we find the best from our society and we all benefit from the best in our society and our community. And that just brings more and more money into our community. And because we then distribute everything that we create and grow and build and invent, we distribute everything amongst ourselves so it benefits everybody without us having to pay for it because we create it in abundance and grow it in abundance. So we don't have to pay for it. There will come a time where people will suddenly wake up one day and go, wow, I haven't used money on my bank account or my credit card for six months because I get my food, I get my technology, I go and eat in our restaurants and so forth, and I get transport because of all the transport in our towns for free because it's ours. And you realize that you didn't use any money. And yet every month you put money and dividends from all our businesses into your bank account that gets distributed equally yeah. to all the members. And, once and, more and i want to mention something here michael because it's important to contrast this with what's going on in the world at the moment with things like 15 minute cities and they're, they're effectively uh. creating cities where everything's available but it still runs off the same money system in fact that money system's getting worse with cbdc's which are central bank digital currencies and controlled mm -hmm. money and all of these things that are happening so it's really important that that there's two this there's, there's the the what michael's doing and some other amazing people out there so i know guys you i'm friends with many people who just that you're creating land and you're growing and you're growing even if you just growing your own food on your balcony because you you live in an apartment seven floors up that's still a huge step in the right direction it's it's it's, it's huge but what's happening with on the other side is they're trying to create cities which are so extraordinarily controlled that are trying to say, oh, we'll have everything will be 15 minutes away. You'll have your food available. You'll have all this. Everything is so convenient, but it's still going to have to go through the money system. And that money system is taking on a level of control that we thought was bad now. It's going to be on a whole new level. So I just want to contrast that, Michael, with what you're talking about now with One Small Town. Yeah. One Small Town is that the community owns and controls everything in their community. It's not controlled by large corporations or government or banks or anyone, we control and own everything. Our businesses, our manufacturing, our own energy supply, our own water purification, our own health and pharmaceutical, everything. We yeah. set up everything. We know how to do all that stuff. Remember, yeah. money does nothing. People do everything. We don't need money. We need each other for that simple reason. That's one of the slogans of, of the One Small Town and the Contributionism Initiative. Money does nothing. You can take a billion dollars, put it in a room. Nothing's going to happen until people get up and do something. The money is not going to plant the seeds and grow the food and process it or purify the water or build you a shelter. Money is going to do nothing. We're going to do it. And I often use an example. It's like, imagine the pioneers or the fur trackers or wherever you had these pioneers in the world. And they, they, they're moving across trying to find a place to settle and, and build a community. They all work together. They didn't compete against each other. Can you imagine pioneers moving in a big group, competing against each other to destroy each other? And that's, a, that's a, the ethos of the, the TV show Survivor. Survivor has got nothing to do with survival. It should be conniver. How can I screw everyone else so I can win the money at the end of the show? So Survivor should be called conniver and backstabber because that's not how you survive. You survive by working together and not by competing. So imagine the, the pioneers moving and they suddenly settle down somewhere 
and they're next to a beautiful river for water and they grow their food. And one day they realize that they, there's a forest on the other side of the river, but they have to go all the way around to get and, and you know a long way to get to the forest to get their wood. And one day they decide they're going to build a bridge. So they get all the, the smart people, the guys that know how to build bridges. They don't get, they don't get academics that, know, that have theory. They actually get people that know how to build a bridge. They don't get someone that says, I have a certificate in building bridges. Well, have you ever built? No, but I got the certificate. See, that's the education system. It's screwed up. You don't know. You have no idea how to do anything, but you have a certificate that says you can do that. This is this is the, the insanity of our education system. So remember that when you most of the things that we study at, at university or college, when you leave, you have to go and do an apprenticeship or an internship to learn how to do that thing. So why did you study this in the first place? Why don't you just do the apprenticeship, learn how to do it, and carry on doing it? Yeah, so no, it's all all part of the mechanism. I hear you. Back to the bridge. <laughs> so we get the people together. We build the bridge. Now I say we have a bridge. We built it. We the stonemasons quarry the stone. We put the bridge together, and we start taking a shortcut to the forest, get the wood for ourselves, and the bridge works for us. At which point? Do we, as the people that build a bridge, hand it over to some third party or a banker or a company that says they're going to maintain the bridge, but they're going to charge us to use the bridge that we built? At which point do we do that? The answer is at no point. At no point are we as a community that build the bridge to serve us going to hand that over to a third party that's going to charge us to use, to, to, to pay and to use what we created. And that's what has happened to us. Everything that we build and create. Remember, we the people work in the factories. We build the cars, the roads, the rockets, the technology, the, the pharmaceuticals. We do it. It's not done by machines. Well, a lot of it is done by machines, but ultimately people do the work. And yet we get no benefit of anything that we do. Therefore, it's, it is a horrible thing to say. It's unimaginable that a country has negative growth or that a country has debt. How can a country be in debt? Who are we indebted to when we have 7 billion people or 7.5 billion people that wake up every morning and we go and do something? We grow food, we manufacture stuff, we, we invent stuff, we play music, we play sport. We, we, everything we do is positive energy. We are constantly creating and co-creating this insane abundance much of it is destroyed. If it can't be sold back to us, then it's destroyed. And that's the absolute evil tragedy that happens. If they can't sell it to us, if we can't buy it, it gets destroyed and discarded. Keep and in mind that... It's dilapidated and, and falls into disrepair. And we see exactly. this happen with these towns around the world and places where community halls are in disrepair. No, nothing's been painted. Houses, you walk through Cairo. Uh, it happens in most cities, of course, but it just, Cairo is a sp special example of just absolute dilapidation. I mean, just rubbish on the streets, people just all over the place. No one paints their house. You know, it just falls into disrepair because the people have been falling into disrepair. This is what's happening with us as humanity. Um, so I know, Michael, we need to start to finish off. I think you've got a few more points, though, that you want to just you want to touch base on. Um, but it's remarkable. I mean, this, this conversation is. Yeah, so it, it's really comes down to people realizing that the power lies with the people. We have no negative growth. We can't have negative growth. We only have positive growth. We are miracles of creation. There are trillions of cells that work together in harmony. All right. Let's start acting like the cells in our bodies. Or if, if the cells in our bodies don't cooperate and collaborate, if they don't work together, we get into a state of disease, disease. We get sick and we die. We got to start working in our communities like the cells in our bodies. Start echoing that example. And the interesting thing is that even when the, the specialized group of cells, whether it's your heart cell or your lung cells or your blood cells or your skin cells or any, all the cells, these are specialized groups of cells. When they gang up together to form the heart or form the liver or the kidney, they don't start fighting the other cells and the other organs. They still all work together in beautiful, harmonious unity. Because if they don't work together in harmony and in unity, your body will explode. It'll literally explode from the friction of vibration and in disharmony or, or dis, in, in, in dis-ease. Okay? So... 
Let's start working in harmony, in unity, in cooperation and collaboration for the greater good of our small communities, of the great communities, and in the whole world together. And that's what the One Small Town Initiative is all about. Reintroducing people to the power and the strength of us working together as a united community, building, creating, growing, inventing, manufacturing everything we choose for ourselves and in abundance so that we can share it and export it. In the beginning, we will export it, make money, and at a certain stage, we'll start to share it because we no longer need to use money. And that's where we're heading. And that's what the One Small Town Initiative is all about. It's all about understanding, comprehending, not understanding, not standing under someone's authority. It's all about comprehending how the financial systems have been pulled over our eyes, how we've been enslaved by it, how all the large technologies and the group, the large corporations are in cahoots with the big bankers and the, and the, and the puppet governments that answer to the bankers. Our governments have been stolen from us. Our leaders have been stolen from us. They answer to a high authority, which is the global international royal political banking elite that now seem to run the world. We, with the One Small Town Initiative, can make a huge difference. We can break away while we still can before they somehow start to restrict us from doing that. Let's start doing this as soon as we humanly possibly can. Start working in the One Small Town Initiative and making this a reality. Uh, what I can tell you, it is exploding around the world. There are literally hundreds of people contacting me now on a daily basis, wanting to start the One Small Town Initiative. Our blockchain technology platform uh, is making it more and more possible for us to do that and speed this up. Um, and I believe that by the end of 2023, we'll be in a position for anyone anywhere to start a One Small Town Initiative if they want to lead by example and initiate this in their community. And that's going to be a domino effect and a chain reaction that I can't even predict. No one can predict what's going to happen. And uh, keep in mind that part of this whole thing is our, our blockchain platform, our own little community uh, token, the One Small Town Infinity token that everybody gets in their digital wallet. It is our own club kind of token. It is not an alternative currency. It is not a, a cryptocurrency the way cryptocurrencies have been launched and, and, and sold and, and people profiteering off them. This is a community token that is valued by the sweat equity of the people of our community. And I think this, this could be a change for the world in a way that nobody has predicted. So everything is in place and we just need to start doing it and using the system now. Beautiful. Michael, absolutely fantastic. Eh? So those listening to this, you know, you've got two choices at the end of the day. You can keep on every day going out and bowing and praying to the Lord with the lower L <laughs> and be be in service to the system and, and this whole massive financial structure that's been placed which has got ramifications across everything as you mentioned it, education pharmaceuticals this is this is what happens this is what we're involved in so you can either carry on buying and praying to the lord in your actions every day to the system in service to that system or you can start waving uh start waving bye-bye to the lord with the lower l uh, and start to say no we, we don't want to be part of this anymore we want to create something new and and really unleash the that beautiful crystalline spirit that that is within each of us the eternal structures the eternal spirit with each of us that creates that magic that we're all in um indelibly linked to and connected to in this greater multiverse of of just magic and and sheer unadulterated beauty um because that's who we and, really and, are and constant creation constant creation yeah that's amazing so just finally from my side scotty is that we're i want to stress this very very clearly is you don't create a new system by fighting the existing system Remember, we can't beat the global elite at their game. They have all the guns, they have all the money, they have all the corporations and all the judges and the courtrooms and the police. We can't beat them. We can't fight them. It's not a winnable situation. But what we can do is we create a new system without any violence, opposition or conflict that slowly but surely starts to make the current system obsolete. Many wise men and women have said this before me. And I'm now saying this, pay attention to this. We're not fighting the system. We're very gently creating a new system in which we all choose to participate and co-create abundance and prosperity. And before you know it, it'll make the current system obsolete. Yeah, beautiful. Um, 
Michael, I'll also ask if we can put um, the Ubuntu Contributionism book. Um, I think it's 11 different languages now. Extraordinary feat. Well done. It's just mind blowing. Uh, it's 12. It's Japanese as well now. So it's 12. Goodness, that's yeah. just magic. So you've got, you got a bunch of books. We'll put the, the, the links in the description, um, as well as obviously links to your other books. And then, of course, One Small Town and, and people can get involved. Sure, Michael, what an epic, epic story. I'm so glad we finally got to tell the story. Um, it's about time. It's It's beautiful, mate. Congratulations. Well done. Um, and well, it's thank you, Scotty. You, you, you've played pleasure. a big role in all of this. Yeah, you've played a big role in all of this for many years. And it's 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 a pleasure knowing you as always. Uh, you're a good friend. And let's keep let's keep um, sharing the information yeah. going out, staying, staying positive, staying inspired and inspiring as many people as we can. Yeah, Michael, thank you so much, my friend. Till next time. Okay. Till next time. Bye for now.